Today's message is the second part in a two-part series that we're doing dealing with the Adventist ordination crisis. Today would be part two. You might be wondering, what is that all about? Within the Seventh-day Adventist church, as has happened with a number of other churches before denominations, a great discussion has evolved in the last few years over the subject of women's ordination. Our church meets once every five years as an international body to discuss various issues of theology and doctrine and this subject is coming up and there's been a significant discussion on this topic around the world in the last uh, few months, few years and uh, there's been a lot of, I believe, good studies, biblical information. I think there's been some misinformation and I've just felt really impressed that now is the time before our leaders come together and people and delegates come together to talk about this to cover the subject. Uh, now I told you last week um, some of what, a lot more than what I share is in a new book that is out called The Adventist Ordination Crisis. I'm telling you here because I promised that there'd be a free copy after the service today. I didn't want to give it to you before the service. You wouldn't listen to the sermon. You'd be reading the book. And I would like to ask one per family, please, uh, because I think we do have a, a limited number back there. But there's good news, and any of you here can get a free copy online. If you'd like to know, and those who may be watching or streaming, want to welcome you as well. If you'd like to know what you do, if you'd like to have a free online streaming copy, then you just dial the number 99000 and you write in the word crisis. It'll give you a link to download the whole PDF version of the book and so anybody can read it for free, um, those that are here today. Um, and there are a number of other good books that are available on this subject. Now, just to give you a little background, um, we were talking about 10 points connected to the subject of women's ordination and we've been going through them. So as we resume the message this week, we're gonna talk a little bit about submission. The Bible talks about women submitting to their husbands. You can read this in Ephesians 5.22. And while I'm talking about submission, I want you to also be thinking about does the Son submit to the Father, God the Son to God the Father. Ephesians 5.22, wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife even as Christ is the head of the church his body, and is himself the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, also so should the wives submit to their husbands and everything. That's a pretty powerful verse. This is Paul. This is New Testament. And it's talking about a good, holy type of submission because it's comparing it with the beautiful relationship between Christ and the bride and also there is a submission of Christ to the Father. Now let me just read a few verses for you. Uh, on this subject. 1 Corinthians 11.3 But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ. The head of woman is man. First of all, I want to make sure you got that verse down. 1 Corinthians 11.3 The head of the woman is man and the head of Christ is God. Now isn't Christ God? So it's talking about God the Father, right? Is that a bad thing? Is that a new thing? Some say, well, that submission is just because of sin. That happened, that happened after the fall. That before that, there was absolutely no difference, no authority, no submission between the Father and the Son and the Spirit. Uh, no, I respectfully disagree. The Bible seems to indicate it goes back through eternity. Let me give you a few verses. John 17, 22. And the glory, this is that great prayer of unity. The glory that you gave me, I have given them that they may be one just as we are one. So the oneness that God is calling for between us as believers is the same kind of oneness that you have between the Father and the Son. But is there a difference in authority and respect? Yeah, it seems to be. For God so loved the world, God who? God the Father. He gave what? His Son. In order to give something, don't you need to own it or have some authority over it in order for you to give it? How do you give away? You know, it's really nice if I give away your stuff. But I have really no right to do that. And so that's implied right in that great verse of John 3.16. You can look in John 5.22. The Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. 
in order for the father to have the authority to commit the judgment to the son it indicates he's got this right to do that and the son respects that Hebrews 1 verse 2 he God the father has in these last days spoken to us by his son who he has appointed heir of all things in order to appoint the son heir when did he need the authority to do that has, who he has appointed heir of all things through whom he made the worlds and in the great commission Jesus said all authority has been given me in heaven and earth given by who who else would have the right to give that authority but the father so do you see there seems to be in the Bible that there is a distinction of authority that is respected by the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. You constantly have the Father glorifying the Son, but the Son is respecting the authority of the Father. And the Spirit is always extolling the Father and the Son. You know, there's a... Uh, bringing this all back to our subject of the relationship between men and women, and this plays out then in the church. The husband is the head of the family, as Christ is the head of the church. By the way, I'm reading from First Testimonies to the Church 307. First Testimonies to the Church 307. The husband is the head of the family, as Christ is the head of the church, and any course which the wife might pursue to lessen his influence and lead him to come down from that dignified, responsible position is displeasing to God. It is the duty of the wife to yield her wishes with her will to her husband. Both should be yielding but the word of God gives preference to the judgment of the husband and it will not detract from the dignity of the wife to yield to him whom she has chosen to be her counselor, advisor, and protector. The husband should maintain his position in the family with all meekness yet with decision. Now was that ambiguous or is that clear? If that's clear, say amen. I mean, even if you disagree, if it was clear what it's saying, that's all I'm agreeing with. That's all I'm asking for. Oh, you know, by the way, there's one more statement I left out about the relationship between the Father and the Son. This is Review and Herald, December 17, 1872. The Son of God was next in authority to the great lawgiver, meaning the Father. Next in authority. It's speaking of prior to the fall and the world. So in the Bible and in our foundational history, it's very clear submission was part of a perfect universe. Are there varying degrees of angels? Do they grudgingly submit or do they willfully, joyfully, lovingly submit? Now, I got to reiterate, submission between a husband and wife is never a problem if the husband has the mind and the spirit of Christ. Uh, No one has a problem submitting to Jesus when you think he died for me. And a husband as the protector and provider of the family, if he would die for his wife, then it's it's a little easier to uh, have that kind of appropriate submission never should a wife submit to her husband if he is asking her to do something contrary to the expressed will of God is that clear because that's you know God must always come first and occasionally I have someone say the Bible says honor your father and mother what does a young person do if the father and mother ask them to lie or to steal you must put your obligation to God even ahead of your obligation to your mother and your father. Doesn't Jesus say, if anyone loves me more, or if anyone loves father and mother, or sister, or brother more than me, he is not worthy of me. So God must come first. Isn't that right? Amen. All right. But once that's taken care of and we love the Lord with all our heart, we need to know how to love and submit to one another. All right. Now, that was all really by way of introduction. I want to get back where we kind of left off. We were talking about um, the, the spirit of prophecy and some of Ellen White's statements Uh, on point number five some have said well one of the leaders one of the foundational uh, inspired people in the Seventh-day Adventist Church was a woman Ellen White wrote more than any other woman in history and uh, her books have been translated more than any other woman around the world just incredible influence that she's had on everything from education to medicine and health how can we say that it's wrong for a woman to be ordained as a pastor if we have someone with this prophetic gift in our church. We explain in the Bible there's a very big difference between someone being a prophet and someone being a priest. Uh, King David was ordained as a king but he was not ordained as a priest. Uh, Someone could be a prophet but that didn't mean they were automatically a priest. And a king could not do the work of a priest. And so Ellen White we believe was a prophetess. 
Uh, Miriam was a prophetess, but she never served in the sanctuary to do what her brothers did as priests. These are roles that were specifically roles that typified Christ that men were to fulfill. You know, during the Passover, it's to take a male lamb. Why would it say that? A lamb is a lamb, right? Parts is parts, isn't what they used to say? What, what difference does it make whether it's a male? Why was it important for that lamb to be a male? Because it typified Christ. And we told you earlier, seven miracle births in the Bible, all those miracle births were baby boys because they were all types of Christ. Now some have said, well, wasn't Ellen White ordained? And the reason they say this is because there are credentials that were issued by the church. Ellen White was never ordained as a pastor, though some have tried to argue that. They try to recreate history that doesn't exist. And I've heard it irresponsibly quoted that Ellen White was ordained as a pastor. If you go to the E.G. White estate and they just scour the history, they say there's no record that she was ever ordained. There are no witnesses to this mysterious hidden ordination that took place. This all springs from a certificate that they gave many church workers. And here's a copy of the certificate. Karen and I took this when we were in Australia at uh, Ellen White's home there. What is that, Sunnyside? Yeah, and it's on the wall. Anyone can take a picture. And I think I took this one with my own camera. They gave these credentials to many church workers, men and women. It just sim they only had one printed up. And it simply meant that they were employed by the church. She actually, in this one, took her pen and marked out the word ordained. Because, yes, we believe that men and women can be involved in ministry. But an ordained minister that administers the sacred rites of the church, the Bible always says that was a man. And it seems like we're making it clear the doors for women to minister are wide open. Amazing Facts is doing all it can to empower women for ministry. Why is there such a battle that there no longer be any difference? What's behind that? Anyway, and there's a, you can actually see the picture of that. Um, there's no record that Ellen White was ever ordained. No witnesses to it, no date for it. She was never ordained as a pastor. She never referred her to herself as an ordained minister. She never performed a baptism. She never performed a marriage. She never claimed to be an officer or administrator in the church. She never claimed to be a pastor of a congregation. And so this is just a, a, a church myth that has been replicated and repeated many times and it is not uh, true. It cannot stand up. Some are wondering, what about the statement? Ellen White does make a statement. And, you know, out of the millions of words that she's written, there is this statement, and you can find this in the Call Porter Evangelist, page 50. It is the accompaniment of the Holy Spirit of God that prepares workers, both men and women, to become pastors to the flock. People read that, and they pass it around, and they say, aha. Well, the word pastor, used classically, is not talking about an ordained minister. Pastoring or pastoral gifts are one of the gifts of the Spirit that is mentioned in Ephesians chapter 4. Many of you here have pastoral gifts. It's using the word classically like someone who feeds sheep. Should only pastors be the ones, only ordained ministers be the ones that feed the sheep? Or do many people in a congregation have gifts to nurture and help feed the sheep? And this is in a book on call porter ministry. It's specifically talking about going into homes and circulating Christian literature and studying Christian literature with people. And if you read the whole quote, and this is from, again, the book Call Porter Ministry. I remember when I first came into church, a call porter. What's a call porter? This is someone who helps sell Christian books. You Google that, you might not even find the word. <laughs> they don't use it much anymore. All who desire an opportunity for true ministry. How many? All. Boys, girls, men, women, young, old, everybody. So this is the context of what she's talking about. All who desire an opportunity for true ministry and will give themselves unreservedly to God will find in the canvassing work, that's the call porter work, opportunities to speak upon many things, this is the pastoral work she's talking about, pertaining to the future immortal life. There are some who are adapted to the work of call porter who can accomplish more in this line than in preaching. She compares it to and opposes it to the ordained pastor that would be preaching. If you were here for the live interview last night, you might have heard me use the example that you've got women pastors in the Bible. Rachel pastored the sheep of Laban, her father, right? You've got the daughters of Jethro that took care of their father's sheep, seven girls. But in both those stories, it's interesting, when Rachel wanted to water the sheep, she needed the man, Jacob, came along. 
he took the stone away from the mouth. I'm assuming you know this story in the Bible. And when the daughters of Jethro were being harassed about water once again, it was a man. One man, Moses, was able to fend off all those other men, pastors. He was a protector and a provider in that situation. Ended up marrying one of those girl pastors. So the word pastor means they help feed the sheep. People have tried to make a lot out of that statement. That's pretty serious when you consider Ellen White wrote 25 million words and over 100,000 pages on virtually every conceivable subject. If she thought women should be ordained pastors, you can be sure she would have said that. The strongest proof that she did not believe that is through her entire 70 years of public ministry. Not once does she say women should be ordained as pastors of congregations. Matter of fact, let's be honest. Let's read just a few uh, of the statements of what she does say. Pray for me. You know, I've just sometimes I get wound up on something. I, I want to make sure that I've got the spirit of Christ and I don't get. Sometimes, you know, when you're sure of what you believe, you can come off sounding arrogant. And that's the last thing I want to do. Uh, because I want people to just listen to what the truth is. Five Testimonies 598. Those who stand as ministers in the sacred desk should be men of blameless reputation. Acts of the Apostles 526 people are needed faithful shepherds who will not flatter God's people or treat them harshly but who will feed them with the bread of life men who in their lives feel daily the converting power of the Holy Spirit who cherish a strong unselfish love towards those for whom they labor councils on health page 82 men who have been set apart by the laying on of hands to minister in the sacred things so here you've got a very clear connection that those who are set apart by the laying on of hands to be ministering should be men. Now here's a long one. Nine Testimonies 263. But I want you to notice how clearly it accentuates these are the roles of men. Nine Testimonies 263 and I'll read 264. From these scriptures we learn that the Lord has certain men to fill certain positions. God will teach his people to move carefully and make wise choice of men who will not betray sacred trusts. If in Christ's day the believers needed to be guarded in their choice of men for positions of responsibility, we who are living in this time certainly need to move with great discretion. The Lord God of heaven has chosen experienced men to bear the responsibilities of his cause. These men have a special influence. If all or are accorded the power given to these chosen men, a halt will be called to the work. Did you hear that? If all are called, if everyone's doing the work that God normally chooses special men for, it'll slow the work, it'll halt the work. The health of the, gen and this is uh, page 264 also, same book. The health of the general work depends upon the faithfulness of the men appointed to carry out the will of God in the churches. Now this next one is from Five Testimonies, page 60. This is to me, you know, you would say, I guess in basketball vernacular, this is what they call a slam dunk. About were, was there to be a distinction in the roles? She says, the primary object of our college was to afford young men opportunity to study for the ministry and prepare young persons of both sexes to become Bible workers, to become workers in various branches of the cause. You see the distinction? It's there on the screen. Men were to pre prepare for ministry, both sexes, men and women, in various lines. This was what she believed. And you can see it all through the, let me give you one more here. There's a lot more than I have time to read. It would be tedious for you. Nine Testimonies 265. Men must be placed in charge who will obtain an enlarged experience not in the things of self but in the things of God and enlarged knowledge in the character of Christ. So this was clearly the pattern of the history. This is what Ellen White taught. We've given you the examples from the Bible in our former message. Point number five is a delicate one. You know, Jesus said, you'll know them by their fruits. And to me, just the way that this is being pushed and promoted seems to have a, an air of rebellion about it. In other words, what I'm saying is our church as a world body has not yet voted to agree that women should be ordained as pastors. But in spite of that, a number of unions and conferences are rushing ahead of the vote, figuring it'll be easier to ask forgiveness than permission, 
and they had these emergency constituency meetings. What was the emergency, please? You know, it's something that you might consider that in the case of an emergency constituency meeting, the executive committee has a great deal of latitude in picking the delegates. By the way, that is published in the Pacific Union Recorder. And so, a lot of delegates got handpicked, and then they had this emergency constituency committee, committee, and they voted to move ahead and ordain women in spite of the fact they knew the church was going to vote on it soon. They couldn't wait. That's not how the Spirit of God works. And I, I just say that, you know, we, we have an ordination studying committee that was doing a lot of work. People from both sides were represented, bringing our report. We're going to come together and do it as Christ would do it. But no, there's been a rushing ahead. And um, that, to me, I think, is the wrong spirit. Um, and then to top that off, one reason I'm doing this message now in our general conferences about a month from now is because I was going to hold my peace. Because when we left our last meeting from the theology committee, they said, now let's just pray and let people study. But that's not what's been happening. There has been a full court press, no holds barred propaganda campaign to circulate the other view around North America and other parts of the world. Books have been sent to every church. There have been bulletin inserts sent to every church. There are people that are making the circuits and camp meetings. And, and I finally said, look, you know, I can't be quiet. I've got to say something because this isn't right. It's not true, and I'm concerned it is not good for the church. You know, we, people see it as a crisis. Both sides are calling it a crisis. Some are trying to downplay it, so it's just a minor point of theology, but they know it's serious because you can look how many millions of dollars are being spent to change the thinking because this subject has come to our general conference two times before and has been voted down. I'm hoping that this time it'll be settled forever and that uh, we'll stick with the Bible in that. You know, there's a verse. I just, I wondered whether or not to even read you this verse because it's so strong, but I want to be faithful to declare all the counsel of God, as Paul said. Isaiah 3.12. As for my people, children are their oppressors and women rule over them. O oh, my people, those who lead you cause you to err and destroy the way of your paths. What in the world does that mean? Does it sound like that Isaiah the prophet is saying it is a good thing for God's people to be oppressed by children and ruled by women? Or does it sound like he's saying this is a judgment? And what's bringing it on? Those who lead you are causing you to err and destroying the way of your paths. I am very sorry for some of the rebellious things that are being done by leadership in this department. You might also read Ezekiel 13, 17. Likewise, son of man, set your face against the daughters of your people who prophesy out of their own heart. Prophesy against them. I almost felt like the Lord was saying, Doug, you got to speak up. There are, are people that are putting themselves in the positions that God said are not appropriate, not biblical, and I'm just concerned what's going to happen to our message if we start to uh, sacrifice what the biblical principles are. You know, they say that those that do not learn from history are what? Doomed to repeat it. Why don't we take a brief look at the history of some of the other denominations good people in these churches that have experienced this same struggle that we're now facing. Because I believe it'll cripple the mission of the church. And this is point number six, what it's going to do to our, our outreach and our evangelism. And we're just going to look at several, uh, about four, well, we'll be looking at five eventually, major denominations, Lutherans, Methodists, Anglicans, and Presbyterians, and at the end, Southern Baptists. First of all, Lutherans. The Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, ELCA, is the largest Lutheran body in the U.S. They began ordaining women in 1970 when the Lutheran Church in America ordained Reverend Elizabeth Platts. The ordination of women is now non-controversial within the ELCA. From their peak membership of 5,288,000 in 1987, only 4.5 million Lutherans remained in the ECLA in 2011. In all, this is a staggering loss of over 1.2 million members, or 23% of their membership, says Reverend Kevin Voigts. According to data from the Barna Group, 
Between 1997 and 2004, Sunday school attendance dropped by 40% among the evangelical Lutheran churches in America. What does it say about the future? 40% drop in attendance in the Sunday school. That's the young people. One reason that was noted, notice this. One reason that was noted for the decline was that women pastors took over churches, as they took over churches, it seemed there was a corresponding number of men that became disengaged. If you want to see a church grow strong, then mobilize the men. Get the men to become spiritual leaders in their family and Christ-like husbands for their wives. And that nothing will grow a church faster than when men begin to really have a connection with Christ. Get the men out of the picture and it goes the other direction. Methodist Church. Now there's a lot of studies on the Lutherans and you can research this on your own. Methodists on May 4, 1956 in Minneapolis, Minnesota, the General Conference of the Methodist Church approved full clergy rights for women. Since then, they've also experienced a catastrophic decline. At their 2012 General Conference, Reverend Adam Hamilton told the full body, listen, this is at their general, they have a conference like we, Seventh-day Adventists are structured very much like the Methodists. He told their full body, at this present rate of decline from the last five years, we have less than 50 years of the United Methodist Church in the United States. Mark Tooley, president of the Institute on Religion and Democracy and a practicing Methodist, told the Christian Post he did not feel confident in the survival of the United Methodist Church in America. Methodism in the U.S. has lost membership every year since 1964. It has lost over 4.5 million members. There is nothing in its U.S. policies that can or will reverse the decline in the near future. Heading down this course. Well, I could think of something that would reverse it but it would be politically incorrect. Methodist, good people. This is, uh, it's sad what's happening. Okay, let's talk for a moment about what's happened with the Anglican Church. That's the same thing as Episcopal Church, Church of England in America. The U.S. Episcopal Church, which began ordaining without regard to gender in 1976, experienced a precipitous decline in both baptized members and average weekly worship attendance, according to the Christian Post reporter. In 2010, the TEC membership in the United States dipped below the 2 million mark, which is far removed from its peak membership of 3.6 million. That's like a 55% drop in 1966 was their peak. In 1974, in the United States, one, 11 women, known as the Philadelphia 11, were controversially, controversially ordained to the priesthood in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Four more women, called the Washington Four, were ordained in 1975. And all of these ordinations were ruled irregular. They did what happened in our church where it was unofficial, it was against their policy, but they did it anyway because they had been done without the authorization of the Episcopal Church's general convention. The ordinations were formalized and accepted in 1976 following an approval by their general convention. That's their general conference. Measures to provide the ordination of women to the priesthood and the episcopate. Um, more sunny news. This is written by Rod Dreyer, July 8, 2012. More sunny news for your Sunday morning Numbers of the Episcopal Church show a stunning collapse in church attendance between 2000 and 2010. It is down 23% overall, with some dioceses far steeper in decline. Pittsburgh, for example, has lost 73% of its church-going Episcopalians over that time period. When you look at what's happening in the churches that are following this same cultural process, it's not an explosion of evangelistic growth. They say if you don't stand for something, you fall for anything. The churches that are growing are the ones that are clear about what they believe even though it is requiring a sacrifice or may seem unique. When people know you have specific values that you stand for that you will not compromise, they want to be part of that. Um, San Joaquin saw four out of five of its people stop coming to church in the last decade. Whew. Presbyterian Church USA. You know, when I first became a Christian, I worshiped with the Presbyterian Church. Uh, they began ordaining women in 1959, urging that it would help them grow their church. In 60 years, the church has declined over 55%. The PCUSA now reports 1.84 million members. That's less than half of its peak membership of 4.25 million and down 
from 1.95 million members in 2011. In the last 10 years, their membership has declined by 500,000, just North America. Now, while we're on that subject, virtually everywhere in the world where women are assuming the position of pastor in Christians, where, where a church formerly believed that only men should be pastors, when they change that belief, then you see a precipitous decline. Now, there's one exception. You're going to hear this announced a lot, and that's what is happening in China. China is a unique phenomenon. Do not be deceived when you hear reports about the women in China. I've been to China four times now. You know that, praise God, I'm so thankful. Amazing Facts had the privilege of being the first foreign ministry to hold a public evangelistic crusade in China in 59 years. And that was just this last April. This is actually a picture of a baptism that took place. We had 200 people baptized. I worked with a lady pastor. It is true. There are many more women pastors in China than men pastors, but they are not ordained pastors. There are a few ordained pastors. Many of the women pastors in China do not want to be ordained because they're reading what they find in the Bible. But they're wanting to serve because men in China have to work on Sabbath. Women, you know, they have a one-child policy in China, but the women are allowed to stay home because of children. They don't have to work the same way. It is so hard to get men, there's a number of old men and some young men, but it is so hard to get men in the churches that there are about four out of five in the Chinese churches are women. Now, that's just my estimate based on what I saw in the congregations. I don't know that that's official, but it is definitely disproportionate. Obviously, the women need to carry a lot more of the work. But when you point to China, keep in mind, the Seventh-day Adventist Church is not officially recognized in China, our regular body, because the Chinese government controls the churches in China. So they have their own Chinese version of leadership for the church in China. And so the rules are a little bit uh, fast and loose over there. Every Christian church is growing in China. Every Christian church. They have, as they have relaxed their prohibitions against Christianity, there's, you know, 1.3 or 4 billion people in the world are in China. And they're now, they're so hungry for the gospel, there's just an explosion of interest. And so it's not the best paradigm. Virtually everywhere else in the world that you look, where women's ordination is being urged, the membership is going down. In, in Germany, there are fewer German Seventh-day Adventists now than there were at the end of World War II. There are a number that have come into the country, but you know where they're coming from? Romania, where the church is growing, where they do not believe that women should be pastors. And it just, it's just interesting, the dynamic you see, where are the fastest places in our church? South America, Inner America, Africa, what do they believe? Same thing that uh, the historic church believes, what we're teaching you today. Churches are growing. Anglo Seventh-day Adventist North America, flat or in decline. There is some growth among the uh, ethnic groups and the immigration in North America, but it's only modest. And so, you know, I'm hoping we could see the handwriting on the wall that this doesn't end well. I don't believe that it's a moving of the spirit that is going to bring great revival based on history. All right, enough about that. So I, I sort of already underscored the point that um, it uh, underscores um, or it undermines evangelism. Now, the next thing I'm going to talk about briefly, it's, always, it's very delicate, but it's so much in our culture, I have to address it, and some will be outraged that I had the audacity to say this. Are women's ordination and same-sex marriage connected? Is there a link? Well, on a very simple elementary level, in a culture where there is so much gender distinction, confusion, anything anyone does to blur or muddy those distinctions empowers the agenda of the homosexual uh, militants in the country. It doesn't make it harder, it makes it easier. Now that's not just what I'm saying, this is what you get from a number of uh, experts on the subject. Um, and I know, I should add, there are a lot of very sincere people that believe that women should be ordained as pastors that are vehemently against homosexual marriage. But you're not going to find a single person, you know, there are people in our church that are in favor of homosexual marriage. Uh, let's say, yeah, there are churches in North America that are um, welcoming, practicing homosexuals into church. 
Now, everybody's welcome to come and visit our church, but when it comes to membership, that's something else, right? You're not going to find any of the people in the church. There's a lot of liberal problems we're having in the church. Those that typically are rejecting literal six-day creation, that are in favor of same-sex marriage, that are rejecting the spirit of prophecy in the sanctuary, are 100%. I haven't met one that is not also in favor of women's ordination. And so, you know, Jesus said you'll kind of know them by their fruits. It, they're just very strange partnerships that are there. So, um, this was just in the paper uh, this last week. God should be a she. Church of England's female priests call to end male imagery. A pressure, a pressure group called Watch or Women and Church want to stop what they believe is the sexist language and male imagery in the services. Watch Chairman Hillary Colton said to the Sunday Times this is in England that the issue has been discussed at a high level within the Anglican Church and the church was working towards a more feminized liturgy. She said, we're at the very preliminary stages in terms of shifting the language of worship. The Church of England just voted a few weeks ago their first female bishop of the church. And so you can see this happening everywhere. Here, I just talked about our Presbyterian brothers and sisters. U.S. Pres and this is um, March 17 this year. U.S. Presbyterian Church approved same-sex marriage amendment. Presbyterian Church Tuesday approved a change in the wording of the Constitution to include same-sex marriage, a move that threatens to further splinter one of the, uh, the country's largest mainline Protestant denominations. A majority of the 171 regional presbyteries of the church have now voted to change the wording of the Constitution to define marriage as a commitment between two people, where before it was a man and a woman. The new wording takes effect June 21. You know on your marriage license in California, it used to say man and wife? Now it's two individuals. And the marriage, it's, it's happening, it's affecting us. Um, all of this is serving to undermine evangelism. I'll tell you the reason I get so passionate about this. I have a lot of friends that are members of other churches. I have a lot of friends, you know I'm part of the NRB, National Religious Broadcasters Organization, and I, I know ministry leaders from, I, I could name many now, I won't put them on the spot, but I'm friends with a number of them that you watch on TV, you hear them on the radio, I believe they love the Lord, and they love the Word of God, we differ on certain points of theology, but they're telling me, and members of their denominations are connected with are telling me, we're wondering where we can go now because our churches are closing. People are walking out. They're looking for a church that still stands for the Bible. As their churches that once used to be more Bible-based are sacrificing these, these, they're sacrificing these basic biblical fundamentals. They're saying, I want to be a Christian. Where do I go? The seventh day, I'm excited and I'm worried. I'm excited because we are at the threshold. We stand at the, the portals of the greatest evangelistic opportunity. You know what the second angel, angel's message is? Babylon has fallen, has fallen. Come out of her, my people. Blended in all this religious confusion around the world, God has his children. And as they see what's happening, they are going to be looking, where do I go? This is the time for Seventh-day Adventists to be giving the trumpet a certain clear sound that we go by the Bible. The reason we keep the Sabbath, it's in the Bible. The reason we have our beliefs on your body being the temple of the Holy Spirit, it's in the Bible. Most of the evangelists that I know, they're all together on this. Some of them are afraid to say anything because they're afraid what might happen to their ministries. There's a little bit of pressure coming from leadership if you haven't noticed and they're afraid about what the political fallout will be if the vote is lost in um, Texas. And so they'll tell me, so, Brother Doug, I, how are we going to do evangelism with this new theology? How are we going to preach with this new hermeneutic, our message? They realize how dangerous it is, and, and I hope some of them will speak up before it's too late and uh, let the world know. But we, we've got great opportunity that's coming if we don't lose it right now. So, um, let me see, I need to hasten along. You know, another reason I'm concerned is it seems like women's ordination is often connected with a bouquet of other biblical compromises. I already mentioned that Genesis is a foundational place. There are certain things that are doctrines that are immovable. 
if the church begins to think the first 11 chapters of Genesis are just spiritual, that they were fables, you know, a lot of places, even in our denomination, they say, oh, you can't take, you know, Genesis 1 through 11, Noah and the Ark, Tower of Babel, Adam and Eve, Garden of Eden, they believe in evolution, they're very progressive in their thinking, they also support women's ordination, but as soon as you begin to say that Genesis is not literal, as soon as you don't take Genesis seriously, it undermines creation. Creation goes away and you become an evolutionist. And if you're an evolutionist, you don't believe the rest of the Bible because Jesus said, if you do not believe Moses, how will you believe my word? Right? Marriage, where do we get that? Genesis. The distinction between men and women, male and female, he made them. The verse that says, your desire will be to your husband and he will have authority over you. Genesis. And if you start watering down Genesis, those are foundational pillars that we can't tamper with. I don't believe we should tamper with any of the Bible. But I think it's a foundational issue. It's not just some little nuance of theology that is not significant. I think it has a chain reaction, a major chain reaction that will come from getting this wrong. You know what we need? The greatest want in the world is the want of men, men that will not be bought or sold, men that will stand for the right though the heavens fall, men that are as true to duty as the needle is to the pole. Greatest want is for there to be a revival. What does it say? Last words in the Old Testament. Malachi chapter 4. I'll pour out my spirit. No, no. I'll send you Elijah the prophet and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. We need to have a revival of men in the church that will stand up for Christ and not be that courage, that manliness. This is what Ellen White pled for so many times. And men in North America and around the world are being neutered by our culture. Is that blunt enough for you? And that is not good for marriages. That is not good for children. That is not good for the church. It is not good for the country. Certainly not good for the military. So this is a gateway doctrine. You've heard of gateway drugs? And when you have a poster child and you want to promote something, you take the most heart-moving, most beautiful, most attractive, most innocent-looking child and you hold them forth to be the representative for the whole thing. That's what a poster child is. The most attractive and innocent doctrine that is a compromise that's being held forth in the most beautiful language is this issue of women's ordination. Who wouldn't want to have fairness? and everybody be able to do everything. And you know, you can use such beautiful language to promote something like that, but it requires a change of theology that is going to have a domino effect in other areas. Well, friends, so where do we go from here? Um, it's being suggested at our upcoming general conference that we already know that there are certain parts of the world, certain conferences and unions that said, we're going to do this no matter what. Hasn't that been clear to everybody? Yes. And so if we vote not, if we vote to stick with what we've always believed and not to ordain women as pastors, as a world church teaching, they're basically saying, you're going to divide the church because we're going to keep doing it anyway. And I've heard those statements. Regardless of what the vote is, the horse is out of the barn, we're not going back. I've heard those statements. And so they'll say, you're going to be responsible for dividing the church if you don't compromise and let us do what we want. You know, I knew a dear lady one time, her husband used to beat her. And then she'd leave him. And then he'd call her on the phone and say, you've got to come back or I'm going to kill myself. And she'd come back. He'd be good for a while. Then he'd hit her again. Then she'd leave. Say, I'm going to commit suicide and it'll be your fault. She went through that for a while and finally she came to her senses and said, well, if you're going to kill yourself, that is your decision. But don't blame it on me. We believe what the church has believed since Adam. If you look at the foundational teachings of the Lutherans and of the Baptists and of the Presbyterians and of the Methodists and when they were formed, the Calvinists, these churches, this was a self-evident truth. It was not debated. It was understood. It was accepted. And there was great reformations and revival in the context of having the biblical order. But you start turning that around and it, it's just not going to be healthy for the church. So I am praying that God's people will stand for the Bible. I don't know exactly what the 
political maneuvering and logistics and the mechanics of what's going to happen with the parliamentary procedure and we're just going to have to give that to God's hand and uh, pray that he guides. Um, I pray that the people of God will vote their conscience at that time. But I want to give you a little word of encouragement. I told you I was going to mention the, um, the Baptists. You know, the Southern Baptists in 1984 started ordaining women as pastors. Uh, before 84, there were a number of women that were being ordained as pastors. And they said, you can't go back now. We've done it. Finally, it came to their, their convention. And after careful study, they said, we can't support this biblically. If we're going to be a Bible church, we need to reverse this. And they voted a policy that only men were ordained as pastors. And some said, well, we're going to leave and we're going to divide. And well, you know what? For the next 20 years after that vote, they grew to 16 million members. And I've, I've talked to and visited with uh, some of the people that were part of that convention and know the leaders, some of the leadership. And uh, boy, it was a struggle. And it, just, it, it was very painful. But they said, we need to be faithful to Christ. I'm hoping our church will have that kind of courage because you'll see others looking around. They're going to look and say, the Seventh-day Adventists really do stand for the Bible. And we're going to be consistent. And uh, just pray. You need to pray for this. And you know, with everything else happening in the world, I mean, you look at what's happening on the religious front in the world. And with the, even just, I made a video this week. A group of Christians from several denominations met in Phoenix and said, let's just get rid of any of our denominational barriers and let's reunite with Rome. And the Pope sent them a personal message. And he's coming to America. And you can just see so many things falling into place for the final events. This could be the catalyst for a revival, for a shaking and the outpouring of the Spirit uh, on our people. And you know what it's going to be based on? It's got to be based on truth. So I'm worried that this could affect the unity of our message. Some will argue that for the sake of unity, we should compromise truth. Um, I don't believe that's accurate. Let me give you a... Jesus said, sanctify them through thy truth. He wants us to be one. But what did he say in John 17? One on the Bible. If you look in historical sketches, 197, we cannot purchase peace and unity by sacrificing the truth. The conflict might be long and painful, but at any cost, we must hold fast to the Word of God. I want to read you another one. Gospel Workers, page 92. We cannot surrender the truth in order to accomplish this union. Speaking of unity, Men would affect a union through conformity to popular opinions, through much compromise with the world. But truth is God's basis for the unity of his people. And so while some are saying, well, you know, some parts of the world, they think that we should not ordain women. And there are parts of the world that think we should. Let's just all vote to let everyone decide for themselves. You know, if you don't stand for something, you really fall for anything. And... Um, it's kind of like the story Aesop had a fable. And he said there was a war between the beasts and the birds. And the, uh, the bird said to the bats, will you fight with us against the beasts? And the bat said, yes, I'm a bird, I'm a bird. And then the beasts said to the bat, will you fight with us against the birds? And the bat said, I'm a beast, see, I can crawl. But when the war came out, he didn't fight with anybody. And after the war... They said, you can't stay with us. And the bird said, you can't stay with us. The beast said, you can't stay with us. And they say, that's how the bats ended up living in the dark. <laughs> of course, that's Aesop. But you've got to stand for something. And we need to stand for the truth. You'll never have to apologize if you say to Jesus, I wanted to stand for your word and what the Bible said. Will there sometimes be division? Did Jesus say, I've sent the word of God so that there wouldn't be any division? Or did he say, I came not to send peace but a sword? There may be division. I think we should do all we can to unite based on the Bible. Have we been told in the last days that the church, is, there's going to be a shaking? There's going to be some polarizing. Will we be honest? Is there some division now? Already. I mean, we just, so, you know, we can't live in this fantasy that we're all going to just wake up one day and no one's going to have any differences. So how do we decide? By what's going to be the least painful or what Jesus says? And I hope that we'll do that, friends. And I pray that uh, we'll take a stand for the truth. If we don't get this right, if, willing, if we're willing to compromise the word of God for some illusion of peace on what we think is this teaching, what's 
making us think we will not compromise the word of God for something like the Sabbath in the near future. And that's why I think it's so important that we take a stand for the word of God and for the foundation of Christ's teaching, the Bible. Amen?